We're in the second week of a series that we're going through, a nine-week series called Woke. And uh, we're starting with this cultural conversation where someone considers themselves to be awake, to be aware of the right issues. And we're using it, though, as a starting point to go on and talk about what is most important. Are we aware and awake to the most important things? And if you're familiar with this designation, woke, and you know the conversation, you know it typically relates to matters of social justice and racism and different things like that. And I want to begin by recognizing the value of those conversations, and not necessarily the conclusions that everyone draws, but the fact that we are a broken people. And that we as the people of God are called not to write people off because they're part of a certain political party, but to address problems head on and say, we do have a problem. There are problems with social institutions or with racism, and we can talk about those problems as God's people. But I do believe we're at a place in our country where we almost can't talk about those things. Part of this, in my opinion, is the oversimplification of, of cultural issues that are really more complicated than we give them credit for. Uh, Like, for example, being able to say, I believe in women's rights. I value women being able to make choices about their lives, but not at the expense of the value of human life. Can I say those things together, that I'm not anti-woman? Another one is the responsibility to care for our planet which is a gift from God. God put us here to be good stewards of this planet, but not if it means demonizing humans as some sort of foreign virus, when the reality is we are the crown of God's creation. Even as I reference these things, can you feel how it would be easy to get sidetracked? And that's what we do as a culture. That is our norm. We run off in these directions and we're totally trapped in our little narrow perspective of a few things. But in this series, my hope is to bring us to the table together and give some biblical perspective to what it really means to be woke. Not just to a few issues that we say, that's it, that's going to solve all of our problems, but to the reality that we have an enemy who hates us. We have an enemy who comes, according to the Bible, to steal, kill, destroy, and last week we added on divide and frustrate and all the other things that we see. And he doesn't care what we're divided over only that we're divided. And so my hope is in this uh, series to address some of the stuff in our culture, which you're going to hear this morning, but rather than from the standpoint of a political party platform or this is this news channel's aim, I want us to just simply ask over and over, what does God say? What does God have to say? See, I think as Christians, honestly, I think we've been taking more of our cues from secular media than from what God says. But Paul wrote to the early church in 1 Thessalonians and said, you are children of the light. You are children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. See, this is a biblical definition of woke. And we then are forced to ask woke to what? That is what our series is answering and addressing. And all our wokeness, though, the great irony is we can be totally asleep to the ultimate threat to our souls. And so our heart, my heart, is that we would be able to cultivate, first of all, cultivate spiritual awareness, and then by the end, feel equipped to address head-on the threats to our souls. But it starts with realizing we have an enemy, and that's where we were last week, and if you missed that message, you can hop online, download our app, YouTube, blah, blah, blah. You probably can... You have a computer, everyone can go do that for themselves, but you can check that out as sort of a foundational message. We have an enemy, and it's not who you might think. Somebody may hear, we have an enemy, and you're like, yeah, I know, it's the conservatives. (laughs) Or it's those liberals, or it's that social group, or it's this cultural perspective, that's the enemy. But Paul reminds us, biblically, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against, at the end of that verse, he says, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And guys, the question is, if we as the church are oblivious to our real enemy, how can we be any hope to a world that, according to Paul, is walking in darkness? We have to have our heads on straight if we're going to be the light that God calls us to be. So these first three weeks, we're talking about awareness, raising awareness. And we started with the fact that we have an enemy. But this week, I want to drill a little further in that direction. Who is our enemy? 
What is our enemy like? And more practically, how do we recognize the activity of the enemy in our lives, in our world, in our churches, in our schools? How do we recognize his activity? Now, it occurred to me as I was planning and studying for this that it might feel a little bit odd in the church where we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus to take an entire week talking about our enemy. And I was like, okay, so what is the value of that? It reminded me something I shared last week is that I played football in high school. And I, I've, I share that. I've had people come up and be like, you're a football player. Guys, I'm not a football player. <laughs> I played football in high school. Those are different. Um, and I loved it, but I'm not a football player. Anyway, so I played football in high school, but we spent a lot of our time as a team watching tape. And if you play sports, you know watching tape is, is watching previous recordings of the opponent's games. And I vividly remember feeling like this is a waste of time. We should be practicing. We should be running our plays. We should be exercising, getting stronger. But then over time, I started to see the value of knowing the plays that they like to run before we get in game with them. Or being able to recognize the weaknesses that they uh, demonstrate and capitalize on that knowledge. So that was the purpose. The reason we studied tape and you study tape ties into the whole purpose of our series, which is the foundational verse we're using every week where Paul says the goal of all of this is that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. That's the goal. And the tape helped us, in my instance, understand the schemes of our opponents. The plays they like to run in order to move the ball down the field. And I just want to tell you, friends, Satan has spent countless hours watching your tape. Have we returned the favor? Have we invested that same effort in his direction? I will say the way we will be outwitted is if we don't know who he is and we don't know how he works. There's a German uh, a general in the World War II by the name of George Patton. You may have heard of him. It's kind of a big deal. Um, he's a commander in the Allied forces, and a part of his strategy was reading a book written by the enemy, Lieutenant Erwin Rommel of the Nazi army wrote a book called Infantry Attacks where he basically outlined his military strategy. And it was based on his experiences in World War I, but George Patton um, attributed much of his success to reading that book and knowing how Rommel thinks. And that's the, that's the purpose of reviewing the tape, of asking, who is our enemy? How does he work? Is we're not unaware Now, I want to start with an important clarification as we talk about who is the enemy, and then by the end, we're going to be talking about what is he like, and how do we see his activity present in the world. Um, I want to start with an important clarification that Satan is not God's equal rival. Amen? Amen. When, when When I talk about football teams, you know, and we get this picture of God being like, oh man, I scored, but then he came back and scored. Um, or, or, you know, Rommel and Patton. It's not like that. Satan is no real ultimate threat to God's sovereignty or plan. He is a created being. But then that then pulls at the thread of why would God create Satan? Let's talk about that. Back in the beginning, you can read in the very beginning of uh, the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, you read how God created everything. Uh, But something we don't often think about is who was there when God created everything? When he created the world, the universe, who was there? Yeah, Job chapter 38 tells us that when God was creating the world, quote, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. What's the mood here? God, you're, you're awesome. And who are the morning stars? This is universally recognized to be a reference to the angels. And they're all rejoicing and they're celebrating and they're excited that God is doing this thing. And for what it's worth, I believe that Satan was there. We know from the Bible he was an angel, but what kind of angel was Satan? What kind of picture should we have of Satan as, as this angel? Listen to this. God specifically addresses Satan in Ezekiel 28. He says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. 
and then a bunch of stones I don't know, but the red carnelian, pale green peridot, white moonstone, blue-green barrel, onyx, I know a few, green jasper, blue lapis lazuli, that sounds like an Italian dish, but um, (laughs) turquoise and emerald, you get the idea, right? These precious stones all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. Get in the picture? They were given to you on the day you were created. And then God adds, I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. So Satan was not just an angel. He was an exalted angel, a guardian of angels. And I just want to ask, as you hear these words read, what do you picture as far as Satan's description? What do you picture? Uh, For example, does anyone picture this? No? Okay. Um, I searched popular images of Satan. What about this? Anyone picture that? I didn't hear that at all. Now, that's disturbing, so let's move on. What about that? Anybody hear that in that description? Now, now of course, we know Satan didn't stay in that place of perfection, but at a baseline, Satan is a beautiful angel. And I think it is part of what makes him so effective in his role, because when we imagine these cartoony images, these these disturbing caricatures of Satan, we imagine that his activity is restricted to the most obvious expressions of evil. What I mean is when there's a school shooting, we go, yep, that's the foggy red-faced demon with horns. When there's a car bomb, when there's human trafficking, we say, that's evil. How often, though, do we think to look for the activity of an angel, of one who is hiding behind the appearance of all that is good and right and true? We're going to talk about that more later. As I said, though, Satan lost this position, and God goes on in verse 14 to say this, you had access to the holy mountain of God. Verse 15, you were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Verse 17 expounds on that moment. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor rather than the love of God. So I threw you to the ground. He cast Satan out. And it goes on to say he was banished from the mountain of God. And the reason we just read is in a word what? Pride. God had so lavished upon Satan, perfection and beauty and wisdom had given him everything. But over time, as pride always goes, over time we stop thanking God for those things and we start to thank ourselves. I'm the reason I'm here. And then the next logical progression, the next thought is, I deserve more. And that's exactly where Satan was. And there's another passage that captures that moment, that mindset. In Isaiah chapter 14, also referring ultimately to Satan, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. Again, that reference to the angels. I will set my throne on high. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, God. But, verse 15, instead, you were brought down to Sheol to the farthest reaches of the pit. In short, Satan's takeover attempt backfired, wherein seeking to be the highest, he became the lowest. And I want to point out, Before we move on, if you're in your Bibles, if you're looking at these passages, that these passages are addressed technically to earthly kings. I think it's important because I want us to know when we read the Bible, I want us to be able to think about what we're reading and not just take a guy's word for it. Um, But in Ezekiel 28, it's addressed to the king of Tyre, those words. And in Isaiah 14, to the king of Babylon. And here's what I would say about that. Those were real kings uh, to whom some real rebukes were directed, okay? But as you read those words, it's impossible to not hear the echo of something cosmic, something more original in the past. And that's often how prophecy works. There's the immediate reality that people are facing, and then there's always this bigger picture of something typically foretelling what's coming, but in this case, I think, revealing what has happened. And so I think anytime there are abuses of power, I would say it is 
nearly impossible to not get some sort of deja vu reference to that original rebellion. And this isn't just some like literary reference, like, oh, that reminds me of Satan. It is the very real active evil influence of our enemy in the lives and activities of people. When you see this desire to exalt ourselves above everyone else, who do we think that is from? I think of Judas who betrayed Jesus. And on the one hand, he's just a guy who betrayed a guy. But what does Jesus say? The the, the Bible says that Satan entered into him before he betrayed Jesus. Another example is Peter, who's addressing Ananias in Acts chapter 5, and he says, uh, how has Satan so filled your heart that you would lie to the Holy Spirit? See, he, he calls Ananias out, but he ultimately recognizes the influence behind Ananias. And then Peter himself <laughs> takes Jesus aside and says, Jesus, you don't have to suffer. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. My point is there are these human behaviors, but ultimately pictures of Satan's influence. And even today, the prideful desire to be exalted above everyone else, it's basically a virtue in our country. But when we read of Satan's decline, as I, as I was thinking through this this week, I couldn't help but think, why would he throw all that away? Those descriptions we read, perfection and beauty and wisdom and everything you could want. He had authority, he had position, he had influence, he had direct access to the creator. Now, there's some speculation here, and I want to just bracket this, but I, I think it is interesting to think about that all of those angels were there at creation, it says, and they were celebrating, rejoicing at God's work, and God creates light and the land and the seas and, and the birds and the fish. And then on day six, God creates the first ever being who bore his image. The first ever being that you can look at and immediately think of God. Something the angels did not enjoy, right? They didn't have that. And so, of course, all of the angels are are rejoicing, and I wonder, though, if there wasn't at least one angel who saw God's image and thought, why shouldn't I be like God? And to rub salt in the wound, I would also suggest this is probably the moment their job description got changed. They're worshiping God, they're serving God, they're doing all that He calls them to, but then when humans are created, something changes. Listen to Hebrews chapter 1, to which of the angels did God ever say, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Now, if you read this chapter, it's a reference to Jesus, but there is a bigger biblical reference to humanity. Psalm chapter 8, he has crowned us with special honor and glory. But then listen to the next line. In light of that reality, therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. So we don't know conclusively, but I think this was the moment pride rose up. Because if you look at the end of Genesis chapter 2, everything is awesome in the words of the cartoon, right? Everything is exactly as it should be. They're just enjoying. And then there's, it ends, and there's this undefined gap of time. And then Genesis chapter 3 is the next word where it says Eve was in the garden. And then Satan, his first scheme on earth is to go after these image bearers of the God who cast him out of heaven. Ultimately convincing us to follow in his footsteps of rebellion. But I want to take a little time this morning after we've just sort of laid a little bit of a foundation. Who is he? Where is he from? To talk the rest of the time about what is he like? What is his character? And I want to highlight three characteristics of Satan that are that are abundantly clear and consistent throughout Scripture. If you're taking notes, the first one that I want to talk about is that Satan is a liar. (laughs) Satan's a liar. And you see it right out of the gate, Genesis 3. Eve is trying to do the right thing, but God said this. And Satan gets her, first of all, to question God. He doesn't just come and say, well, God's a liar. He says, well, did God really say? Uh, And she questions, and eventually, as we know, he just flat out lies, contrary to what God told Eve Satan says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God knows that. Eve, he's keeping it from you. Of course, Eve listened and ate, and the reason she listened, guys, this sounds true. 
It sounds good. It sounds right. And, and that's the whole point of a successful lie. See, we can put up on the screen and say, Satan's a liar. And when we say that, I think some of us picture the, the foggy demon horned guy. Yeah, sinister liar, but don't, don't picture that. Satan's an angel. <laughs> he doesn't come to Eve and say, God's a liar. I hate God. Would you hate him with me? Does he? No, he says, Eve, here's fruit. Fruit has fiber. It's good for you, right? What could possibly go wrong? Plus, this is special fruit. When you eat this fruit, your eyes are going to be opened, and you're going to be like God. Does that sound good to anybody? Yeah. No, come on, man. Come on board. <laughs> special fruit that makes you like God? It's just being honest. That's okay. But the first thing to understand is that a lie isn't a successful lie unless it sounds true. So practically, you're like, okay, Michael, what's the point? The point is, if you're looking for the lies of our culture, for example, don't look for what's obviously evil. Look for what seems right, but at the same time is contrary to what God says. I know this can sound confusing, but that's the whole point of a lie. I wish I could make it more black and white. I think of Peter, again, with Jesus. He's coming alongside Jesus and saying, Jesus, hey, we're going to get through this, man. You're talking about suffering and stuff? No, no, no. I'm Peter. I'm with you. I got your back. We're going to avoid all of this. He's, you know what I call that in human terms? That's a good friend. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's like I look at Peter and I'm like, dude, he's just caring for Jesus. But what does Jesus say? Thank you, Peter. No. Yeah, he turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. I don't think he's calling Peter Satan. He's recognizing who's actually influencing right here. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For, here it is, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Listen, right here is the key. Jesus was familiar with the things of God. And so as reasonable as Peter's friendly exhortation and concern sounded, Jesus knew better. Why? He was familiar with what God had said. Now, I will say absolutely, if we are not familiar with the things of God, with the words of God, the things of man will prevail every time in our lives. He will win, and we will begin to think in terms of human reasoning, which make total sense if I don't know the things of God. It's interesting that Jesus goes on after this to say, if you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. What? You have to be able to take up your cross if you actually want to live. That doesn't make sense because it's not a thing of man. All of this is summarized, though, by what Paul says, where he says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Now, what's a masquerade? It's a masquerade is a mask. And a masquerade is an appearance that is hiding the true reality. It's hiding the identity of the person behind the mask. So I think what, what Paul is ultimately saying is Satan appears as an angel of light. If you look at Satan, he's an angel of light. But that is not who he is. It is a masquerade. Thankfully, though, we have other passages in the Bible that pull back the mask, where it says Satan ro roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's who he is. He's seeking to kill and destroy anything that reminds him of God. We have another description in the book of Revelation, this apocalyptic picture of things to come where we have images like golden lampstands and bowls of wrath being poured out. But one of these images is an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. I personally think this is apocalyptic imagery designed to show us Satan's true character. He hates us. He wants everything to burn because he knows what he had and that he can't ever get it back. But what I want us to take from this is those images are not what Satan is going to show us. He's an angel of light. Which means practically that when Satan lies, it's, it's going to sound right. If we don't know the things of God, if we don't know what God's word says. And obviously you can imagine how complicated this gets in our culture. And it is. It's complicated. I think about, for example, racism. Can we agree racism is bad? Yeah. 
And racism, our, our country has a messy history with racism and mistreating people groups. And we want to address those things. And it's still a problem today. Racism exists. However, when I look at many of the leading attempts to address racism, it seems they're actually just perpetuating racism. Rather than focusing on what unites us as humanity, we've just put a different race in the crosshairs. We have the oppressor-oppressed model. It's this polarized thing where we just demonize a different race because of the color of their skin. And then we pin all of society's problems on this one conversation. Everything would be fixed. And that's just not biblically true. God is so clear the root of our issues isn't race. It is sin in the human heart. Doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. The problem is the same. And as long as we are trying to punish people, whatever the color of their skin is, we won't fix the problem of racism. I'll just tell you that right now. Another issue in our culture seems so right is where everyone is entitled to everything. It's a growing trend, Uh, but what it is is basically where the access to opportunity, which is what makes America so great, has devolved into the demand for basically everything. And who doesn't want everything? I want everything. The problem is what kind of people are we becoming as we lose the incentive to do the very thing God originally made Adam to do, which is work? I'm not pretending, by the way, that I'm the expert, that I have all the answers. I am sure that I probably believe some lies myself. But I want us to hear that the only way to recognize lies is if we know what God says. And, 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 and just one more to illustrate that particular point, which I know is a touchy issue, but I think is an important one to talk about. If our world says that we are dealing with a dispensable mass of tissue in the womb, which is what the world says, But the Bible says that every baby is fearfully and wonderfully created by God in the mother's womb. The question is, who do we believe? Now, I'm not suggesting that these situations are simple. Well, now we have the Bible answer. We also have biology to back that up. It is very plain and obvious what that baby is. It's human. But I think we've been so informed by secular culture and desire to not make people mad that we just back out. And this is where somebody, if we could have a dialogue, which I always long for, but this isn't really the place probably, would stand up and say, well, you hate women, which isn't true. But that's the false dichotomy that we've been forced to buy into, that I can't love women and be for women's rights and also for little infants. Isaiah described a reality in Isaiah chapter 5 where good is called evil and evil is called good. That's where we live. People who are trying to advocate for what's right are called evil and haters, whereas those who are actively going against what God says are being celebrated. And the point, friends, is Satan isn't going to come at us with an evil cause and say, please buy into this. He's going to come at us with a good cause that if we don't know any better will ultimately lead us away from what God actually says. So Satan's a liar. And no one was more definitive about this than Jesus. Speaking of masquerading as light, who did Jesus spend most of his time rebuking? Was it those secular evil people? It was the religious leaders who were supposed to be leading people to the truth, but were actually taking them away from the God who made them. It's humbling, but Jesus, one of these times in John chapter 8, says this to the religious leaders. Tell me if you can hear Jesus saying this. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. So you see again this contrast between the God of truth and the father of lies. And the only way we're ever going to recognize the latter is if we become really familiar with the former. The second characteristic, though, is right here in these verses where Jesus just said, Satan's a liar, but he's also a murderer. And I was thinking about Genesis as a kind of an outline. Chapter 3 is the first lie, uh, at least that we know of. Chapter 4 is the first murder. And you may know the story of Cain, who was jealous of his brother Abel. And verse 8 of that chapter says he rose up against his brother and killed him. But then... Centuries later, John 
writing to the early church, identifies the influence behind Cain's decision. He says to the church, love one another. And then in contrast says, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. So you see, again, he's identifying Cain made a choice, and he's responsible for that choice. But you know who was ultimately behind that? The one who loves to destroy. And Jesus says, from the beginning, he's been a murderer. And that's where that verse in John 10, 10, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And again, this is a reflection of the fact that he hates God. He hates humans made in the image of that same God. He hates anything that reminds him of what he used to have. Obviously, we could spend all morning talking about the evidences of this characteristic in our world and our culture. I have to highlight the 70 million abortions a year, but I would also add on school shootings, suicide rates, violent crimes. I even got on a rabbit trail this week reading studies of the effects of violent video games. It's kind of random. One of the most popular games right now was referenced by a Supreme Court justice in an attempted law, it didn't pass, but a law that was attempted to restrict access or limit exposure for these uh, games for kids. And this justice observed the following in his statement. In this game, victims by the dozens are killed with every imaginable implement, including machine guns, shotguns, clubs, hammers, axes, swords, and chainsaws. Victims are dismembered, decapitated, disemboweled, set on fire, and chopped into little pieces. There's actually another paragraph that I didn't have the guts to read. For real. I just couldn't get it out. Who do you think enjoys that? I read a few studies on the effects of these games on children where it showed increasing numbness to this kind of violence statistically increases likelihood of acting violently and aggressively toward other people. Surprise. My question for us, I'm not standing up here today saying what video games or movies you need to have in your house. Bring me your list and I'll tell you what's approved. That's not why I'm here. But I would love to ask the question, are we okay with this? Are we okay with the effect that the things that we watch is, uh, or, or participate in or we let in has on our souls? Do we even think it matters or affects us? Or are we so caught up in the fact that we can as Americans that we haven't stopped to ask whether or not we should? And evaluating our decisions beyond just the pressure of my kids saying my friends are doing it. <laughs> Trust me, I'm there. Or, hey, well, that's my favorite actor. Cool. Is that it? Is that biblical criteria? Somehow I would suggest as I even preach this to myself, we have to regain sensitivity to the activity of the enemy in our world. We have to. So he's a liar, he's a murderer, and the last one that we'll end with, Satan is a thief. And that's the beginning of Jesus' statement in John 10, um, I've kind of never noticed. I've heard it so many times. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, destroy. The thief. That's who he is. But something that occurred to me is then Jesus follows that statement by saying what about himself? I have come to give you life. I've come to give you abundant life. So in short, Jesus comes to give, Satan wants to take. You remember that? (laughs) Jesus comes to give you all that he made you for. Satan wants to take it all away. And this comes back to the original verse that we are building this series upon, that Satan might not outwit us. Now, you know that word outwit. That's a Greek word up on the screen that's something like pleonecteo. And that word means this, to cheat someone out of something that belongs to them. So think about this. Satan outwitting us doesn't just mean he's fooling us. It means very specifically that he's trying to get us to give up what is rightfully ours. You follow? That's what outwitting means. I'm cheating you into thinking that something that in uh, the Bible God says is yours in Christ, I'm going to tell you it's not. So that you go, oh well. You see, Satan can't take anything away from us. He doesn't have the authority for it. But we can give it up. We can hand it over. We can say, ah, yeah, I am horrible, I am lost, I am a failure. 
All of the things that God says we've been given in his word, salvation, adoption, belonging, unconditional love, hope, future, joy, forgiveness, peace. Keep going. They're all ours in Christ. Victory, power over the enemy. And he comes and says, you're powerless. You're unloved. You're not popular enough. And that's his outwitting. He gets us to give up what is ours in Christ. Now, the good news, as I just said, is it's ours. We don't have to go find it. We don't have to pay for it. Jesus already did. We just have to recognize it and call it what it is and hold on to it and say, it's mine. And I would end by saying all of this is because of what Jesus did at the cross. None of this is ours apart from Christ. We are hopelessly lost. We are sitting ducks if we don't have Christ in us. The hope of glory, the power over sin, not perfect, but absolutely progressing in our victorious calling. And just remembering at the end of the day, as bad as the struggle gets, Satan is defeated. We don't have to wonder how the story ends. He is, he's like, I had this picture this morning of a guy who gets knocked off a cliff and he's just grabbing onto branches on the way down. He knows his time is short and he's desperate. And by the way, where that statement comes from, he knows his time is short, is Revelation 12. And listen to what it says about believers in this chapter who follow Jesus. They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Oh, I like the first half of that. The second half, though, points to the fact that this isn't easy. And it could get way worse. But we win because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. What that means to me is there's not some sort of superstitious power in the blood, like if you, you get sprinkled by it and you're healed, you know. The power of the blood is the practical change it makes in the lives of people. It's being able to say this reality that Jesus died to bring into existence is changing me. And it's the active, it's not a one-time transaction, but an ongoing application of what Jesus did at the cross for us. Amen? That's the power. That's the overcoming power. is isn't just the blood of the lamb and saying, Jesus died for me. Gosh, but if we don't have a word of testimony to that, we're going to languish. We have to re- regularly come back to that and say, okay, well, what is the gospel? What is the good news? you got to get in the Word and say, ah, wow, I had forgotten that. I testified that that is true for me, and that is power, overcoming power. Um, so when Satan comes to take, we can say, no, no, that's mine. That's mine in Christ. And we refuse to give that up. And so as we close, um, appropriately, we're going to receive communion. I want to invite our worship team up. And again, as we do this, this this is not some special cracker juice that we bought on a holy website. It's just a cracker. And it's just some juice. And the juice honestly tastes a little funky to me. (laughs) I I don't know. We got maybe got it in COVID or something, and it's been I don't know. But please drink. Um, (laughs) It's not about the juice. It's not about the cracker. It's a symbol of our willingness, the individual's willingness to say, I am going to take in the reality of the gospel of Jesus for myself. And I love how Jesus, when he handed out the bread and the juice, he didn't say, here's the bread. Here's the cup. You see him? Do you believe him? Cool. Nope. He said, eat. Take it in. Make it a part of who you are and your internal process. Let it affect everything about you, right? That's what this represents is a choice to say, I am going to recognize what's mine in Christ and I'm going to take it. I'm going to hold on to it. And so as we receive communion today, I want to encourage you to um, add some words to your testimony, right? The blood of the lamb, that's done. That can never be undone. He he defeated the enemy. He said um, in Colossians, he disarmed the enemy into the cross. He took away the one weapon Satan had against us, which is death. And Jesus says, nope, that's not going to have any power over my people anymore. Satan's like, oh, so now he's just scrambling and panicking. But he disarmed him at the cross. The cross, the, the blood of the lamb is in place. However, the overcoming power comes in the word of the testimony also of saying, this is who Jesus is to me. Or maybe you're 
not in a place of confidence right now. You are broken and you are weak and you're just saying, Jesus, I need the power of your gospel, blood, resurrection, all of it brought to life in my body and in my life and in my relationships and in my job. Pour out your heart to God. That's what this is meant to be as a reminder of the blood of Jesus that energizes the word of our testimony, you see. So I'm going to pray for us, but before I do that, I wanted to just read a few verses leading up to that statement in Revelation 12 where it says that they overcame by the power of the blood. Listen to this about our enemy. Satan and his angels were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. That is an interesting insight that when you read the Bible, you see several instances of Satan appearing before God, and it's always to accuse you, to accuse me. And you see that in Job chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 3 is a really powerful, vivid illustration of what God does with Satan's accusation is brilliant. Zechariah chapter 3. But he can't take what we have, so all he has to do is just lie. He's just stamped there lying. And 1 John chapter 2 says, though, this, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Would you read those words with me? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In the face of every accusation, Jesus is our defender. And what that means is Satan hasn't won a single case against you. Hebrews chapter seven adds on, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. You ever heard the expression one, one job? You know that uh, it's a little, little, little old now, but um, Jesus has one job. He always lives to pray for you. He always lives to stand between the enemy's accusations and the love of the Father and to say, no, they are mine. So would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you are our advocate that even as we pray now, you are praying for us, that you always live to advocate on our behalf. I pray though even more, Lord, and thank you that there is coming a day when there will be no more need for advocacy, that the enemy will be entirely taken out. But in the meantime, Jesus, we remember your sacrifice at the cross where you disarmed our enemy. Lord, I pray that today we would be able to add to the word of our testimony. We'd be able to recognize a lie that we've been believing. We'd be able to notice some influence of the enemy that we've been okay with up till this point. And we'd be able to testify to the power of the cross to overcome those things. Lord, I pray that you would make us more and more aware of what you've done for us. And most importantly, what that means for us today. We pray all of this in your name for your glory, Jesus. We look to you. Speak to us in this time, God. Let this not be some religious ritual that we race our way through, but make yourself known, Jesus, by your spirit. We ask it in your powerful name for your glory and our good. Amen.